Hey, that's awesome. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody's faces and those at home. Welcome who are watching us online, and we want to welcome you to our service this morning. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where we're picking back up in our study through the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul moves from the theme of the rapture of the church, and we've used that, didn't we, to kind of springboard on three or four teachings of the end times. I think it's, it's, it's needed, the end time teachings. You don't really get a lot of it nowadays in the church, but uh, I believe it's, it's needed, and we took time for that, and we're back to going verse by verse through this through this. Uh, Letter to the Thessalonians, and we will finish it this morning, Lord willing. But now Paul comes back to earth, if I can say. After taking us from the earth uh, into the heavenlies and, and the Bible, you know, explaining to us the yet future events, Paul brings us back to earth where the church is. And with that teaching, as he taught this young church, he expects them to have the, you know, the, the, uh, the heart and the uh, expectation of Christ coming even today, even in his day. That needed expectation as we walk, that motivation as we walk with the Lord, knowing he can come at any time. And even though we anticipate the return of Jesus for his church, And as her church makes herself ready, we're back on earth, speaking of the daily um, living here on the earth, living holy lives and committed, committed guys to grow, to grow in the Lord and to mature in his precious grace. So important for the church to do that. So he ends this letter with giving us really some practical Exhortations. If you read ahead, you you, you understand that. Uh, practical exhortations on the church's relationships. First, he'll speak in verses 12 to 13 about the church leaders. Then 14 to 15, uh, your, your relationship with each other. Uh, 16 to 22, your relationship with the Lord. And 23 to 28, Paul's prayer and ending for the church. So picking it up there in verse 12 of 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Notice leaders, pastors, elders who labor among you. We're the labor force. We're servant leaders. And are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourself. So here Paul begins the topic of the church's relationship to the leadership, to the pastors, the elders, your ministry leaders. And he begins this topic of, of those who have been called by God to oversee the church. You know, Wiersbe says it's tragic when believers neglect or ignore the local church. No family is perfect and no local church is perfect, but without family to protect and provide for him, a child would suffer and die. He says the child of God needs the church family if he is to grow and develop his gifts and serve God. Where are you going to utilize your gifts at? Where are you going to be serving God? First and foremost, it should be at the church, the local church that God has called you to, that the Holy Spirit has you at. Many times people come and they visit us and and we're welcoming visitors and and sometimes they're coming to visit uh, to see where God would have them. They've moved into uh, our city, they moved into our community and and many times I tell them, hey listen, come a few times, see how we do it. Here's a gift bag, it has everything about us. Call for an appointment, we'll meet with you. Uh, If it's close enough, come to our, uh, you know, new uh, visitors, new believers, new, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, members class. Uh, but, but, but be led by the Spirit, amen? 
Because where the Spirit leads you, the Spirit will use you. And, and we're not to come just to sit. Uh, uh, we come to serve. Now, we have a six-month, as you saw, saw there, kind of a, a waiting period. That doesn't mean that you, you can't get involved in, 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 in a fellowship, uh, a men's group. It doesn't mean a woman's group. You can't come to activities and events here. That, that, it's not keeping you from that. But it's really giving you time to really ponder, praying on the Lord, seeking the Holy Spirit. Lord, is this where you want me? You know, there's a reason behind that. And believe me, when I say six months, man, I say, man, that's a long time. But it has worked for us. God has protected us. It protects us from anyone who wants to come and quickly get involved with children's ministry, yet to have other, uh, another mindset of why they want to get involved with children's ministry or why they want to come into the church. There are wolves they come in, and six months, they're, they're out. They're not here. They're gone. Uh, not everybody is a wolf, and not everybody has, has uh, you know, uh, 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 wrong ideas. So don't, don't, don't think that. But it just protects us. But we need a local church. A podcast pastor will not go and visit you in the, in, in, in the hospital. A podcast pastor will not be with you through a funeral, cry with you, laugh with you, and be merry with you at a wedding. A podcast, a a, a pastor or, or a teacher on film can't do that. We need you and you and you need the church. And I'm probably preaching to the choir, but you need to know that as well. In Galatians 3.28 Paul tells us as Christians, we are all one in Christ, aren't we? We are all sheep of our good shepherd of his pasture. But it is the Holy Spirit who calls some, some of us who are sheep to under shepherd his flock. We are the sheepdogs, if you would. We are those who are under shepherds. I'm speaking of pastors. And elders and such. Uh, Paul emphasized this in Acts 20:28 20, in talking to the elders at Ephesus. He said, "Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. You didn't purchase it. He purchased it. Amen. And he went on to say, and even some of you. Imagine that, looking at their eyes, says, are going to be wolves. Even some of you are going to take the credit as, as God uses you to plant a church, and you see the church grow, and you see people coming to the Lord, and people involved. All of a sudden, you get this, uh, uh, you know, this attitude as if you purchased the church. You see, we call that promotion erosion, and it's dangerous. It's very dangerous in the church. So with the call upon the man of God to pastor over God's flock, what responsibilities do the local church have towards their spiritual leader? Well, Paul tells us. He tells us there is, there in verse, uh, again, 12 and, and 13. He says, we urge you. That's, we implore you. He says, we plead with you. We beg you, Paul is saying. Uh, not command or demand, but we, we, we implore you. You see, the leader is not a dictator, nor the church a democracy, but it's a theocracy. What do I mean by that? God is in charge, as I just said. Jesus paid for the church. He planted the church he, by his blood. So we are a theocracy, guys. We're not a, you know, it's God who holds the franchise, if I can say it that way. He's over all the churches. And as a pastor, I'm under his charge. The leadership here, we're all under his charge. He says, we urge you, brethren, to recognize. That that doesn't mean, oh, there's Pastor Mark, there's Pastor Matt, there's Elder Greg, or whatever. No, this word recognize, guys, means to know them, to acknowledge them. Not just to point them out in a room. That word means to appreciate, to value, to value them. To value those who, notice, Labor among you, those who are over you. 
Not only is this what the church should have a relationship with their leadership, but this is what the leadership should also be embracing and doing. We should be laboring. That word means to the point of exhaustion. Laboring in the word of God, laboring in prayer, laboring in doctrine, laboring in counseling people, laboring in the business side. There is a business side to this. God gives us the responsibility to handle the tithes and offering that come in here. And such a temptation, isn't it, for many churches, many leadership fall because, again, they take it upon themselves to say, well, I, I, I'm in charge of this. Don't worry how I spend this money. Don't worry, you know, not realizing that those are the obedient sheep who are giving being obedient to God, giving and trusting leadership. But we are to labor hours before hours and after hours and, and before the Lord. He holds our time clock. He holds our time sheet. I don't know. I, I can't remember back then. He says, not only are we among you, but we are over you to stand before you to superintend, superintend to rule. But notice, in the Lord, as the leaders among equals, again, we're all sheep, the pastor or the elder has been given the responsibility to rule over the flock, to be among the flock. Uh, Hebrews 13, 17 kind of puts it together, doesn't it, for us. He says there, uh, this could be Paul, or we don't really know who the author is, the Holy Spirit. How about that? Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. For they watch out for your what? As those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you, he says, speaking to the church. I'm going to have to give an account, guys. At that, at, that, uh, at that judgment seat of Christ that we talked about a few sermons ago, as I stand before God, I will give an account of how I led this church, how we led this church, this ministry. I'll be there for a while, uh, you know, but, uh, and, and God will, will bring rewards as it comes. But in order for the flock to accomplish what Paul just stated, again, the, the pastor leaders, listen up, leaders, pastors, wherever you are, you should, it says, number one, we have to be visible. We have to be visible in order to be recognized and appreciated. We have to be visible. Number two, we have to be available for you guys, right? He says to be among the sheep. Hey, in order to smell like the sheep, you got to be in the fields with the sheep, Right? Like David was. David was in the field with the sheep. David smelled like the sheep. When they called him in to anoint him, he really smelled like the sheep. Everybody was looking at the bottom of their sandals. Did you step in anything? He was in the midst of his sheep. And this is what a pastor has to be. Make themselves available. As Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 1.5, For our gospel did not come to you in the word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. And in much assurance, and here it is, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. You know who we are. We were among you. We smelt like Thessalonians. <laughs> and then we got to be approachable, visible, available. Listen, some of you feel like you're being called to a higher authority in a sense of more leadership, more re- responsibilities. You got to be approachable. I hope I'm approachable. <laughs> You know, I hope I don't give off some kind of odor or some kind of, you know, shield. Stay away from me. As pastors, we're called to stand before as watchmen over your souls. To rule and exhort as, uh, as the Lord would rule and exhort. And we are to be welcoming as Christ, our good shepherd, is. To have a shepherd's heart. To know what that is, really is. 
And we, those of you that feel like you're called men, you feel like you're called to a higher, to, to, to leadership maybe, God has a call. Hey, man, you better be broken. And you better have a fear of God. And you better be broken before the Lord. And you better love sheep. Not chihuahuas, but sheep. Before you come up and, and tell us, and say, I really feel called, man. I feel maybe I'm going to plant something or plant another church. You better be broken. You better be ready. You better be ready to labor. And we're not out playing golf. Some of you think we are during the week. What do you guys do anyway during the week? We have a lot of fun. We're a family. But we diligently are laboring and reminding ourselves that we have souls that we're accounted to. That's why when people leave, it breaks my heart. I kind of chase after them. I go after them. Wait, 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 whoa. Where are you going, man? It's not about numbers. It's about souls, guys. We all should have that. He says in 13, notice with me, and, and to esteem them. What does that mean? That means to respect them, regard them, honor them. You do that, guys, for us uh, a lot in, pr- in praying for us, and we'll get to that. He says to esteem them very highly in love. The word is agape, for their work's sake. As pastors, uh, we know that we're made out of clay. We know we make mistakes. We know we may say things we maybe we shouldn't have said, and sometimes we even get in the flesh. Can you believe that? We're like sheep, and we're before him. And we should seek to follow God's will. And allowing, again, the Holy Spirit to rule and overrule all our decisions, whether it's a business decision, whether it's a, a decision when we you have to confront somebody, or, 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 a de- or, or any kinds of decision, oh, Holy Spirit, rule over us. Is this what you want, God? Give us wisdom. Help us to lead, Lord. We have a lot of responsibility, but we've chosen, or actually God has chosen us for this call, and we're obedient to it. And notice he says, and be at peace among yourself. Man, when you guys are at peace, it blesses us, right? Right? It really does. Such submission and recognition. Again, know that word, what recognition means. Man, it brings peace in the church. It's wonderful, man. It's glorious. Yet in maintaining this peace among redeemed sinners, and that's what we are, there are those who are difficult within every flock. A sheep or ten. that stray from biblical instruction and obedience. And again, that's another job of the leadership, the pastor. To go after them, to bring them in, to talk to them, to pray for them, to hear them out, and to guide them back to God's word and God's purpose for their life. Those that are discouraged, those that are weak, we, the sheep, the flock, the pen is filled with different types of people. Paul gives the church an exhortation to how you are to be among each other. Your relationship, and I would say your ministry among each other. Look at verse 14. Now we exhort you, he says, that word really means encourage, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. But always pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. Family members must be reminded to minister one to another. For the leadership of the church cannot do it all. Having pastors and elders in a church doesn't excuse the flock from ministering one to another. Paul told Titus to have the older sheep to teach the younger sheep. It befits the pastors and elders, I feel, that if we equip you as saints, 
if when we equip you uh, in the work of the ministry we're called to, and we equip you through the word of God, through the word of wisdom, guiding you and directing you, that it would, behoo- it would bless us because we know that you have a heart for people and you have a heart for your brother and sister in Christ and that you too can minister to them. You can be the helping hands in caring for the flock. I was thinking of Moses uh, as I was worshiping the Lord. You know the story when Joshua uh, chose some men and, and went out and fight, fought with Amalek and so Joshua did as Moses said to him. He went out, he got the army going. And he, they were fighting Amalek, and, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill, and it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel, what? They prevailed, right? They were winning. And then, and when he let down his hand, of course, Amalek prevailed. But Moses, Moses' hands became heavy. You see? So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And then here it is, Aaron and Ur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And friends, we need your hands. Brothers and sisters, we need your hands to help, to minister. And what happened? And it says, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And, and ministry can be messy. Uh, They didn't have deodorant back in those days. And as they were holding his hands up, no doubt, it was a long day, man. And it can be smelly, and it can be messy. But if you have the right heart, you'll be able to approach one another in love and help us. Help us. Don't hurt us. (laughs) Help us, man. You know, it's ministry, guys. Ministering to the flock, he said that we exhort you again, your relationship with others in the church, to warn those who are unruly, disorderly, out of line. There's ways of doing that in love. We don't need drill sergeants. We need loving people who can see something and not say, well, I'll let the pastor handle that. We'll let it go. and We'll let the pastor just handle that or the elder or unruly means, uh, you know, just out of order, out of ranks. If you hear that, it, again, it, it will help you for your local church, for this church. If we go to one another and say, hey, man, what, what, why you got such an attitude? What, what, what's going on? And who knows what's behind that? Maybe they're going through something. But right now they're, they're, they're backstabbing people or they're pa- talking bad about the pastor or talking bad about one of the elders or the leaders. You say, we shouldn't be doing that, brother. Sister, these are the ones that bring grief to us. These are the ones that, that bring grief to the pastors when, when we hear about those things and we've got to deal with those things. And we're not afraid of dealing with them, please. But if, you, but if it can be done at the, among yourselves, that's even greater. That's even greater. Comfort, that means to come along. Side. It's an interesting word, that word comfort. It means to come alongside, not only to come alongside, but to come alongside, if I can say, with, with, with speech, with the mouth, to encourage, to encourage with words. Really, that's what the word is. To come alongside and encourage with words the faint-hearted. Now we're dealing with the broken-spirited brother or sister, the discouraged, the anxious Anxious sheep. And, and, and when you have a broken-spirited sheep, a lot of times they, you know, they're just, they become, you know, they move out. They, they, they isolate, I guess the word can be. And it eventually you don't see them any longer. We need to reach out to those. We need to care for those. Uh, and some of you, you, you know each other closer than, than I know you. And we need to help those. Uphold the weak. That word means to help. Take tender care of not allowing the weak to fall. Uh, we've got a weak brother or we've got a weak sister. We have those sheep that are without strength. They're struggling in their walk. They're weak in their faith maybe. 
Maybe somebody is, is messing with their heart. Somebody's trying to pull them into their grips. And, and we need to be ministering to them, to reach it out to them. You need to be doing that one among each other. And it all requires patience, doesn't it? That's another thing. When we minister to one another, we kind of have a, a timeline. Well, by this time, they should be at this point. And, and when they're not, you know, that's when we tend to give up. And we've got to remember that God never gave up on us. Oh, but we were, not, we were, we were more mature. We were, no, no, God hasn't given up on us, man. We've got to be long-tempered. We've got to be long-suffering. We've got to be slow to anger. With all, he says, notice that. Every sheep is not the same. We each mature in time. So we must give them that time. We must give them that time. Some advance quicker while others don't. We are to be patient with all. I'm sure there's somebody in this congregation, you're struggling in your walk. Somebody has got your ear or your heart and is trying to pull you away. Some of you are anxious. Some of you, you know, you just, you're just at an anxious point of your life. You feel weak. Hey, don't be di- discouraged, but be encouraged that you have a family. Everybody look around. Now, you don't know who you're sitting next to. Maybe that's a bank robber or somebody or used to bank, rob banks. But now we're, for most of us, we're, we've been converted. We've been saved. We've been, we're under the blood of Christ. This is your family, guys. And I know that during this time that we, we've not really been able to fellowship as much as we want, but that's coming back. And we need each other. Look at 15. Here it is. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. <laughs> but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Notice that? For yourselves and for all. We hurt each other. We, we just are sheep. And go, go, go. You know, study sheep. Go read, read Keller's book on, on sheep. You know, we bump heads sometimes, and in doing so, we hurt each other. And we need to deal with that. We, we, you know, and, uh, and, and we need to do it in a, in a good set mind. You know, we need to pray for it before, and then, then we need to deal with those things. I, there was a story about a truck driver who dropped in at an all-night restaurant in Nebraska, and the waitress had just served him, you know, breakfast. And at that time, some three rugged leather necked, leather jacketed, I should say, not leather necked, leather jacketed motor, motorcyclists entered and rushed up to him and came into the restaurant and trying to pick a fight with him. They, one guy grabbed, you know, the hamburger off his plate, the other guy grabbed the fries and the third guy picked up his Coke and drank it right in front of his face, you know. And the trucker did not respond as one expected. Instead, he calmly rose, picked up his check, paid, paid for his meal, put the check and his money on the cash register and went out the door. And the waitress followed him to put the money in the till and stood watching out the door as the big truck driver or the big truck drove away into the night. And when she returned, one of the bikers trying to pick up on her course said, well, that wasn't much of a man. And she says, well, I can't answer that, but he's not much of a truck driver. He just ran over three motorcycles out in the parking lot. <laughs> now, although that sounds good to do, <laughs> and let's be honest, sometimes, come on, but that's your brother or sister. Paul wrote it this way, as we said a few Wednesday nights, Romans 12, pay, repay no evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men, if it is possible, and it indicates that it may not always be possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. He went on to say, beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will pay, says the Lord. Give place to the Lord. The Lord knows how to deal with us. He knows how to deal with each one of us. You're not not the Lord. You make lousy holy spirits, as I say. You do what you need to do. You you do it biblically. You you do it in love. 
And if there needs to be any kind of wrath, any kind of discipline, let the Lord do that. The problem is we don't leave room for that. We get right into it, right? And we use the dagger of this tongue. And we lay them out, man. And at the end we say, and God bless you and have a nice day. That's not right. When we have a forgiving heart towards others, not only, he says, is it good for them, it is good for us. Because we're not allowing them to pay rent in our mind. And that messes us up, doesn't it? It really does, guys. So, no one renders evil for evil to anyone. But pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. Again, guys, he's writing to a church that at this time is probably a year old. And he's teaching them some heavy things, but some needed things. Some needed things that need to be spoken now he, 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 in rapid fire, he, he speaks of uh, seven really personal exhortations in our walk with the Lord. Looking at verse 16. Uh, these are really rapid fire, as I put it here, uh, exhortations. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Bang, 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 bang. Abstain, abstain from every form of evil. Joy, as Paul begins this rapid fire in our walk with the Lord, our relationship with the Lord, I can say, joy is part of the fruit of the what? Of the spirit, Galatians 5, right? It's part of the fruit of the spirit. We may, not be, uh, we may not always want to rejoice, I mean, when it comes to certain circumstances of life, but we can keep the joy. We can say it this way, we can keep the, 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 the lamp lit. We can keep the lamp lit. That's why I wore this, man. We can keep that lamp lit. We can keep the joy candle lit as we know the Lord. And he is good. And these circumstances, listen, shall pass. They shall pass. Just think, no, don't think back, but some of the circumstances that we've gone through, the trials, the tribulations, current trials and tribulations. Got to hold on to Jesus. King David wrote Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life. Amen. And, of course, it would come out of his loins through Jesus, who is the path, the way, the truth, and life. And I like this. In your presence, and that's a present tense, by the way. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence, he's with us. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's future tense. That's hope for the future. Evermore, he says. Somebody said, in this life, our joy is mixed with sorrow like a thorn under the rose. Just came back from a, me and my wife went to a a memorial service for Pastor Dave Hansen. And his wife passed away. And, you know, how do you deal with that? Because there's, uh, there's joy that she's with the Father. But there's grieving that she's no longer among us or with him. And, and um, my wife's driving because she don't like my driving. So I'm thinking um, as she's driving, how do, how, do, how, do we re- how do we reconcile those two? The grieving and the joy. And again, the Lord says, well, you can't. That's why I'm here. Look to me. Let me reconcile him. Let me minister to you. Let me minister to Dave. Because you're not going to be able to reconcile both. Because death on earth is permanent for us. But eternal for those who have gone home to be with the Lord. There's grieving. But then there's joy. And we, you see that. And we saw that yesterday. There's laughter over stories and then breaking down right after. And you know, it breaks your heart for them. But let's enjoy the beauty of the rose. Even though there's a thorn there that we've got to be careful with. 
pray without ceasing. This is not the act, but the attitude of prayer. Sure, we are to pray. Don't get me wrong. But this is simply having a running conversation with God. And guys, I'm telling you, I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing people have a running conversation with God because if they did, there would be a fear of God and the activities that they involve themselves in and get caught in. Have a running conversation with God. Talk to him throughout your day. He loves you, and he loves it when you call upon his name. He loves, I was at a, a, a conference Wednesday night, and, you know, that, that, I never taught at another place on a, on, a, on a night, on a Wednesday night. And it was about my time to get up, and I told Doris, I'm not going up. I'm, that's it. I'm, I'm not going up. I'm not going up. I don't belong here. And, uh, but she pushed me, so I had to go up. But through that time, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking to the Lord. He's, he's, he's my Savior. He's my God. He lives within me. So, God, you know, what am I doing here, Lord? Speak through me, God. You know, because it, it gets difficult sometimes. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, this is everything. Not of everything. But in everything, because he's in with us. I, I, I don't uh, give thanks when, the, when the, uh, you know, the car engine blows up, but I give thanks that I wasn't in the car when it blew up. There are things that happen in life. There are issues in life. There are physical issues. There are mental issues. There are, uh, again, relational issues uh, that, that, that we're not... We're not giving thanks for that, but we give thanks in everything. Notice he said, in everything give thanks. Because thankfulness, guys, is an expression of faith. Thankfulness is an expression of faith. Paul says, give thanks to your God. And he says, do not quench the spirit. That means to suppress to, ex- to extinguish the spirit. He says, it says putting out of a flame. It says, it's a Holy Spirit is primarily quenched by the lack of love. We go back to that. Paul says, do not quench the spirit. Paul says, give ev- and everything give thanks. Paul says, Pray without ceasing. Paul says, rejoice always. He says, because this is the will of God. Which I missed. This is the will of God. The will of God is also is not to quench the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's easy for just one believer to hinder what God wants to do or is doing and quench the Spirit and the enjoyment in the Lord. It just takes one sheep, one person. And those people, usually they don't pray through things. They, they usually don't, you know, take it to the Lord, seek the Lord in it. Lord, is this, is this for us? Is this what you want of us? And is the leadership really walking with you, Lord? Did they make the right decisions? It usually just takes one member, one sheep. And I got, I'm, I'm so glad I got men around me, my wife. And other friends I see out here. Because when I see you, I can bounce that one quenching with what truly is not yes people or no people, but people of faith who walk with us in leadership through All kinds of decisions, whether it comes trials, tribulations, you know. Again, business decisions, worship decisions, how the church is going to be. And this should all be by based on the word of God. I thank you guys for that. Don't despise prophecies. Now, all prophecy must have its base from the prophetic word of God. Amen? The Bible. 
Even if it's a prophecy, and really, I was talking, it's, some people have a word of knowledge. We get it kind of mixed up uh, as if it's prophecy, uh, a word from the Lord. And, and listen, if God has blessed you with that gift, praise God. Praise God. But again, it should be always filtered through the word of God. If it's contrary to the word of God, you know, and even that has to be tested, of course. He'll tell you to test all things here. But do not despise the prophecies. The 1 Corinthians 14, he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men, speaking forth God's word. A lot of times that happens over this pul- pul- pulpit. Unbeknownst to me, unbeknownst to Pastor Matt or whoever is teaching up here, we, we don't realize, but sometimes prophecy is given forth because we're reading and teaching the word of God. But sometimes that word, that sentence, that, that verse is speaking to you personally, going beyond even the theme of any sermon. Because God wanted to meet you here today, and God wanted to give you that verse, and that verse is prophetically spoken to you. There is the gift of prophecy. Not everyone has it. But anything should be tested and made sure that it's biblical. I've had people tell me, hey, Pastor, today uh, the God is speaking to me. I need to go up for 10 minutes and just share some things. And I said, well, you know, loving. I just said, well, you know, uh, God has told me to speak today. But, and then they gave me a five-page. And this, well, this is what he wanted. I, well, praise the Lord. I'll put it right there and. You know, and it came and went. So, test all things, guys. Test all things. Be Bereans, yes, absolutely. Be be biblical. Uh, test the things whether they're genuine or not, and hold fast to what is good. Somebody says, uh, "Eat the meat and what? Spit out the bones." I don't know if that fits here, but I thought I'd say it anyway. And abstain from, listen, from every form all types of evil every form of evil I I don't think I have to go into detail with that every form of evil I'm not going to draw pictures but we have to abstain from that choose to abstain look in the mirror and say no (laughs) as one pastor said just say no not today Satan no no And you will start to grow and you'll start to mature. And if it's a sin that keeps popping up, a sin that that keeps being thrown at you, you keep fighting. You keep wrestling. You put that full armor of God on. And said, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to abstain from every form, all types of evil. Well, now Paul wraps this up by praying for the church. Uh, he, he, He wants to pray for the church. Uh, and he gives some interesting exhortation as we move through. Verse uh, 23, he says, Now may the God of peace, and I'll stop there real quick. You know, we've gone through the end times, and we've spoken of the wrath of God, haven't we? The great white throne judgment of God. And people think that God is not a God of peace, that he's a God of wrath, that he's a God who's angry, that that, listen, the fear of God in the Christian is not that we're afraid of God. We were at one time because we were not saved. The fear of God is honoring and, 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 and blessing God and receiving his son uh, as our Savior and Lord, to honor him, to know that he is holy, and to serve him that way because he is the God of peace in the midst of of chaos and, and life issues. He's a God of peace. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body, notice the trichotomy of man, be preserved blameless when? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, why do you keep coming back to that? Because he is coming. Whether he comes when we take our last breath, or he actually comes and we get to witness together the rapture. It's the theme of this letter, guys. 
It's the theme of this letter, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the motivation for holiness. He who calls you, that is the God of peace who calls you, is faithful, who also will do it. That is, he will sanctify you completely. Stop wrestling with him. Stop fighting. Stop clinging to the worldly things. Allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify you completely to the end and to the coming of the Lord. Once we are justified by the blood of Christ, we are sanctified. Meaning we are set apart, right? We are holy unto God. That's the, that's the fear of God, realizing that he has made me holy. He has sanctified me. He has justified me. He has saved me. Why wouldn't we want to honor him and obey him? We're holy unto God. Because at salvation, what happens? How does he seal us? The Holy Spirit, that's right. We become temples of the Holy Spirit. We need to take care of our temples in the Holy Spirit. We need not to involve ourselves in things that will grieve the Holy Spirit. And he, the Holy Spirit, dwells within our heart. You see, before salvation, guys, we were body, soul, spirit, if I can put it that way. What are you talking about? Well, because we were body, soul, and spirit, our body appetites ruled our lives. We did what we wanted. We engaged in what we wanted to engage it in. We were flesh. The flesh ruled. The flesh ruled through the soul. And in a sense, if I can say it this way, the spirit lay dormant. Now being saved, we are, as Paul wrote, spirit, soul, and body. Our spirit is awakened by the Holy Spirit, And now the Holy Spirit rules our life through our spirit, being sanctified on earth, set apart for the Lord's work until we become glorified. And when is that? In the presence of God. Or as Paul said here, I love him, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The emphasis there is Paul felt like he was coming in my time. And that's the way we should be living. Paul's prayer for the church is that we may be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, watching and ready. Let us not get lackadaisical. Let us not walk in Laodicea, being not hot and being not cold, being lukewarm. I I, I exhort you and myself. When I preach, I'm preaching to myself again. Okay, And it's so easy for us to get lukewarm. It's so easy for us to live in Laodicea. That's not what we are. To, he's coming. Watch and be ready. Well, why is he taking so long? Because there's still souls to be saved. There's still people to respond to the gospel. Stop being so selfish. <laughs> I'm talking to myself. What if he came in 1980? I got saved in 81. So let us not get to a point where we're arguing with God. You're taking so long. Forget it. I'm tired of being set apart. I'm tired of walking this walk. I still love you. You know, I got fire insurance, but I'm going to go out and do what I want to do. Be careful of that, man. We've all been there at one time. We got scars from it. You don't want that. He's given you an abundant life. Now Paul's closing respect. Request, and I will close myself with this. He says, brethren, and I'm going to talk to you personally. Pray for us. Paul's asking this church, just a year old, man, pray for us. The key thing you can do for your leadership here at Calvary Chapel is pray for us. And I know you guys are, man. Things that, are, that be front, things that come before us personally, as a team, man, I know you guys are praying because we, we're discerned for it. We're able to see it. We're able to, to call it. We're able to, to be blessed. And then we're able to protect. So pray for us, okay? 
You say, Pastor, how can we pray for you? How can we pray for your team? The same way you would want someone to pray for you. you say you're struggling with something? Pray for me in that. I'm a man like you. You say you get anger over certain things, or you, hey, pray for me in that as well. I'm flesh, man. I'm a sheep. Pray for us. Anyway, and greet, not grieve. <laughs> but receive joyfully, says all the brethren, with a holy kiss. Now, we'll do holy handshakes when we can. And we'll do one of these, you know, kind of love you, man, but, you know, kind of deals. Singles, that doesn't give you a right to go up and kiss. So, so if I see some slap marks, then I warned you. No. He says, I charge you. Not because he's a a dictator, but notice this. He's an apostle. He's a pastor. He's a shepherd. I I charge you by the Lord. That is so important, man. I know I keep emphasizing that, but you wouldn't believe the guys, some of the people I've run into. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. And guess what? That's what we did, didn't we? We have read this whole epistle to you guys. We all stand now accountable to all that we've read. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And everyone said, Father, we thank you, Lord, for another letter, another book of your Bible that we were able to study through. We ask, God, that we want to be holy people. We want to be righteous. It's all because of your son, God. So please anoint us. Uh, Help us to leave here different than the way we came. Help us in our walk. Help us in our struggles, God. Help us to keep short accounts with you, Lord, when we fail. Help us to be that person that that falls, Lord, and seven times gets up. Help us, Lord God, to be uh, a congregation of your word, uh, those who reach out to one another, but God, mainly, Lord, uh, those who love God like you love. Help us, Lord. We need you, Lord Jesus. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand.